You're listening to a Galactic Network podcast. For more, go to GNCast.com. We are the Elsers. Hello and welcome to Elsters, a production of Galactic Network. I'm Gregor Sprague and joining me is the not on fire Corey Scott. Well, he's on fire, but in the metaphorical sense, not the I, literal I, sense. In in the sex sense, in the uh, your sex is on fire, uh, hunk a hunk of burning Corey. <laughs> yes. Um, and before we get started, I should let you know that for all info on this show, including show notes and subscription links, you can go to elsnerds.com. And for other in, for info on the other Galactic Network programs, you can go to gncast.com. And as a warning on Elsners, we tend to shoot our mouths off without thinking, so we will both spoil things and we will swear liberally. You have been warned. So, Corey, how you doing? It's nice to see that you're not on fire. Yeah. That, you, uh, that your house is there and all that stuff. And I I have been in a in a really weird place. Uh couple weeks ago when we were we were going to do the show on a monday night all of a sudden uh, everything around me just went up in flames now i i, I want to point out uh, my wife and i our home where we're at was perfectly safe uh, my mother-in-law had to come over here and i definitely know people who've lost everything lost their homes lost all their memories yeah. lost all their stuff uh are living in hotels in some cases living with friends living in shelters it's it's incredibly humbling to see the the amount of help that arrived uh sonoma and marin counties and and santa cruz after that shortly um uh, and even more so to see the the people who lost so much still be able to not only function but have a beautiful sense of of peace and and just going on just living their lives and continuing uh it's it's amazing the the resiliency and it just kind of makes you realize that the human condition we think that there are things that would just end us. Like I couldn't survive without this. I couldn't make it without this other thing. And then people somehow bounce back and continue on, kind of because you you have to. Um, it's been it's been really both just hugely unfortunate, of course, but also incredible. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, as you were talking about that, it remind me of uh, one of the shows I watched, The Last Leg. They have they've done a couple of times on their show. They started the hashtag leg up um, and it was just people, you know, mainly again, because this is a British show. So mainly in the United Kingdom um, who either needed a leg up or, you know, needed a helping hand or was willing to give a helping hand um, for anything, you know, like whether it is, you know, something as simple as, hey, I need a place to crash for the night or I need, you know, I need help getting to this job interview or, you know, something like that. And people have been like yeah come on let's go and just help it out that's what that's what i i love to see about about people um in general is just the ability like it's it's easy to think that well everybody is everybody's an asshole you know because i get in modes where i where i'm an asshole and i hang out with assholes i do podcasts with assholes sometimes <laughs> when i show up yeah uh, so it's one of those things you can just, be, I can just be like, you know, everyone's an asshole. And then I get these, and then I see these moments where I get proved wrong. And I love getting proved wrong in that regard. Uh, look out, you know, uh, go to the Red Cross, uh, here in the States, you know, for, to help out, you know, find a local b- blood drive, uh, for not only the people over in California, but I know the, uh, uh, Florida, the hurricanes, Texas, the hurricanes yep. and all that stuff. Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico, god damn it! I I had to I couldn't resist that one. I mean, good god, our president's an idiot. And strike three, <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I get okay about that whole Puerto Rico thing. I get what he was trying to do, um, but at the same time, 
I feel like he should have more done the roll the R, not the try to make the soft sound. Like the Puerto Rico instead of... It's just such a weird time to try to to focus on saying the name right when you're doing everything about helping them wrong. But yeah. that, that's a political thing. And, and, and while We're I am not <laughs> at all adverse to letting people know my political views, I know that's not why you listen to the show. It, it's, it's fine. I, I, I get it. it. How much of that do you get everywhere else? It, you can't yeah. step away from it enough. So we're trying to bring you something else. No. Yeah. We, um, but yeah, so let's get into the news. Uh, the first one is actually news for Corey because Corey didn't know about this. Disney four years ago, three, four years ago, uh, decided to do a, uh, a streaming service sort of called Disney movies anywhere where you would sign in with this to your um your iTunes account, your Amazon account, uh Vudu and Google and you buy the movies, the Disney movies which then later included Lucasfilm and uh the Marvel movies, you bought it in one place, you owned it everywhere. So it's it's one of those like especially on the Android side where there's not really one place to buy movies it is a more separated out uh venture where itunes you know on the apple side it's you know buy it in itunes you know buy everything in the apple ecosystem which was brilliant well, well apple's happy to let you buy it from google or amazon in their ecosystem it's just they want their 30 percent cut yeah yeah um so the beautiful thing with this is disney has partnered up with uh, Paramount and Lionsgate or no sorry um, Paramount and Lionsgate are the two holdouts of this but the they have created partnered with everyone but those two for Movies Anywhere they basically just dropped their name from the title um, this is a new service that much like you know Disney Movies Anywhere does so I was actually sharing with B what I have available because they were doing uh, Google actually did an email if you link two or more uh, accounts together you got five free movies and there were some decent movies um definitely in the free category for some of these i think i've Um, occasionally gotten free voodoo movies uh similarly where it's just like here's randomly here you can get anchorman for free for no good reason uh because you're probably not sick of seeing anchorman yet which which I, i did get one of those I, I did get one of those with Amityville The Awakening on Google. And it was, surprisingly enough, on my Roku Premiere Plus, where I was just like, I was trying to get this stuff linked together so I can just, you know, go to the, go to Google Play Music and or go, Google Play Movies and, you know, watch the movies and all that stuff. I'm like, you want to do this one for this weekend? I'm like, fuck no, it's a horror movie. I don't want to... Damn it, I bought it. Well, bought it. They gave it away for free. Um, Somebody's but, picked out his next guest topic on <laughs> podcast of terror. <laughs> um, but anyways, the turns out so the Amityville movie, that that Amityville movie is a My Little Pony spinoff, and <laughs> much like going for the record, Gregor picks his third movie that isn't a horror movie. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so the other movies that I picked, uh, Big Hero Six, go or that I got that were given to me, uh, Big Hero Six, Ghost Team. The 2016 Ghostbusters, but the subtitle "Answer the Call," the extended edition, um, Ice Age, and Jason Bourne. All in all, some pretty good movies that I got included. But I look here, and I've got you know seven, fourteen, twenty-one, twenty-five movies altogether that I can watch. Purchases from other services, all yeah, added in. Purchase, yeah, purchases from other services, um, or at least from Google Play. You know, from the Google Play movies that. A lot of those are going to transfer over to other, to other movie services. Um, some of them I've, I've already seen, you know, happen. Oh, and actually, I remember what movie it was I was talking about. It was Guardians of the Galaxy that I couldn't get to go through Ultraviolet because I was one of the people who was using Ultraviolet, um, which you mentioned before. Is that it was that competitor where it was, but it was like Ultraviolet was like sort of like the back, the back, uh, the backbone to Voodoo for a lot of it. Um, because they those worked together, but no, so uh, this article from the Verge that we're going to link in our show notes, um, it points out some really cool things that I think if you're not 
doing this yet you you as in Corey or you as in the listeners like growly bear well growly bear is not in the u.s so we have to we have to caveat that this may not work in other countries yeah. at this point it's so it's one of these things that it, it's movies it's, anywhere except some locations which is so everywhere if, except here yeah but here are some cool things if you link it with apple you could get these a lot of these movies upgraded to 4k for free i'm doing air quotes around for free because there's the caveat of and this is gonna be a blanket statement for everything that i'm going to mention you've already paid money to the studio for this movie so a lot of these it just sort of makes sense that you you would get it now the 4k one is a little bit of a stretch Apple has been it, saying that previous purchases through iTunes, if it's available through 4K, yes. they're going to try to upgrade you to 4K for those films. Yeah. Uh, it's a push that they're making that a lot of the film industry isn't really into. And so my question would be, if this qualifies for that, and that's a big if, if you purchase something from Google and, and you start watching it through your iTunes, is it going to qualify to be upgraded to the 4K or not? That's that's first question, is, yeah. is that's even likely. And second, would it then work if you watched it in a different service after that? Are they going to consider you to be a 4K owner? Is it some backdoor like what Apple did their iTunes match years ago and all yeah. the people who have been downloading stuff from Kazaa and LimeWire, uh, LimeWire and everything else suddenly got to get legal copies of their songs by doing it through iTunes match for $30 and uploading everything and then re-downloading it and in some cases getting higher quality uh, than what they had originally gotten from their downloads before. From from reading this article part in the article, it seems like it's just in the Apple side of things, but I could sort of see it going to, you know, switching, you know, going over to, to Vudu and to Amazon. Um, but still, it is like Beat is saying, it is better than nothing because it's certainly um, great if you're an Apple owner of their their hardware and you're in their ecosystem. Yeah. Or even if you've like, um, for example, uh, the the author of the article gives the example of Live, Die, Repeat, Edge of Tomorrow. That was a title that they bought through Ultraviolet. And this is one of the movies that is in 4K. That, you know, would, would qualify for the 4K thing. But they bought it probably when it came out. But yeah, that's a cool thing. It's a smart business move. The other one is uh, you can stream on four different signed-in devices at the same time. Great for families. Great for, you know, the college, you know, situation and stuff like that the movies anywhere titles get perks like itunes extras and, and amazon x-ray when available basically that's but sort that of doesn't a mean that amazon x-ray is going to work through itunes it doesn't mean no. that it's going to work through google so again you have to choose your service and you get the the perks of whatever that service is so apple lets you do 4k you... amazon gives you x-ray uh, Google gives you the HEP. I don't know what Google's really going to give you. They'll they'll just listen to you, watch it, and then record everything that you say. Yeah, you do, but you don't have to choose because it's one of those things. Like, basically, you can like yes, you have the choice when you're watching. Of do you want to use the Amazon X Ray, and then you could go through and watch, you know, and then you know, pause the movie. Who's that actor? And you know, continue on going. Or when they do the like clever little tidbits and stuff like that or which is the other the bigger one the itunes extras so i mean this is something that you know you you could theoretically purchase the movie through amazon watch it through itunes with the itunes extras um right but that's what i mean you have to choose which ecosystem you're going to watch it through and yeah. that also in some cases requires you to have specific hardware because yeah. you can't watch itunes stuff through anything other than the apple tv at this point yeah, uh, and and so you you have to be in Apple's line to to enjoy those those perks. Uh, so just because you bought something in iTunes and you get all the iTunes stuff, you're not going to necessarily get those benefits if you try to watch it through your Roku, which doesn't stream iTunes and it's probably the only service really that it doesn't do. The Amazon stuff probably isn't going to play maybe Google Play stuff, their Fire TV and everything. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but I know that they were fighting very hard to keep their stuff as the primary in their things, and that's why they stopped selling the Apple TV and the Google Android TV, all of those things, because they yeah. didn't 
they said that they didn't meet the requirements to be a good service for Amazon customers because they didn't have access to the things that Amazon didn't give them access to. Yeah, it's it's a the, little annoying because they're still infighting in this stuff, and you still you have to pick your war zone now more than you have to pick your artillery. Yeah, the other some other important you know various things is one is obvious TV shows aren't included because it is called movies anywhere. Duh, it doesn't work on rentals. Another obvious thing you can and like I said before, you can buy movies wherever you want or where they're cheapest. Then the last three are a little bit more important. Uh, the Movies Anywhere app doesn't support 4K or high dynamic range movies, but other apps do. Um, so that one, that one, I feel like could change here in the future, but it's not doing it yet. Uh, movies won't play at all if your computer is hooked up to an external monitor that's not HDCP compliant. So that, you know, some for some desktop viewing, there is that problem. Then the big one. This is a big one for me because. I've as you know, someone you can see my movie, my Blu-ray and 4K collection behind me here, um, including Spider-Man: Homecoming, which I just bought this past week. One of the things I've hated is go to and they give you the website, you know, like Sony Mo- or SonyMovies.com slash Sony Redeem or you know what Paramount.com slash Digital Movie Redemption Code and stuff like that. Now it's just you go to movie any, movies anywhere website, enter the code that you get, you're done. You now have it all across the board. It doesn't matter where you are. That's the big one for me that a lot of people don't realize. The benefit of, of easy access of the thing that you just purchased. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Because it's just it's one of those where you're where you're sitting there and you're like, well, I gotta go through here. Because it was always with everything before. Um, with using ultraviolet it was always a three or four step process yeah um it was you go to their website so you know like uh, disney or you know whoever studio that they give you on the little little download card that comes in the in the box then you type it in like okay yeah this works and then you got to go to the you know disney movies anywhere or voodoo or ultraviolet or itunes google wherever you're going i feel like there's still a lot of, of hiccups when it comes to stuff because there's I feel that it's more convenient when I say go to sign into a service on my Roku mm-hmm. and it gives me the the web link and it says okay go to this link on on your computer or on another device and and you go to to what amazon.com slash Roku and and then you type in the code that's up on your screen that's yeah. great for me it's very convenient for me but if you're the person who's using the streaming box and doesn't have another device for whatever reason, and it seems a little ridiculous that that would be the case. But if that is the case, then you're stuck. You can't get into the service. On the other hand, it sure as hell is a pain in the ass to have to type up my whole email address and and long ass password because I I don't use the same password for everything because I use a password manager into a remote control yeah. on a TV screen. And, and flipping back and forth and stuff like I'm on an old goddamn Nintendo D-pad. <laughs> so it, having a choice is at least something. And I'm surprised still that this is this hasn't been worked out by these things yet. We're still yeah. fighting with these things. Also, if I if I do have my cell phone and I've got my my last pass and everything on it, then I should be able to just like hold up my phone camera to the TV and it gives me a skew that I can scan and then it lets me log in with my account that way. It should be even easier. There's always going to be hiccups on these things. They're not perfect yet. This is still imperfect because of the stuff that it's missing. It would be incredible to me if it included Xfinity, uh, Comcast stuff, because my wife keeps buying movies through Comcast and I keep trying to tell her, babe, if we get rid of Comcast, which I would like to do, especially if Sonic comes over to our neighborhood and gives us that gigabit that they keep talking about, you're going to lose all of these films that you've purchased. Comcast does not work if you aren't a Comcast subscriber. It's (laughs) not like buying stuff from Google or iTunes or anything else. It's like you are in their ecosystem and that's it. So I don't see them giving that up, but that would be, that would be where this would become beneficial for me. Otherwise I I don't buy DVD or Blu-ray movies anymore. I don't get I don't buy a lot of movies period I I stream stuff more than anything 
or at this time because I've got Comcast, it, I watch it on cable. Uh, so it's it's not really something that I'm jumping up and down about, but I can see the benefits for many others, and it is a oh, yeah. serious step in the right direction because one thing that's always been said, uh, I, I know that that these things get more use and become more successful the easier they are for people to use them. And so why... You, yeah, you, you, you did just freeze there for a second, Corey, so we lost oh, it. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. It, it was um, it was a great it was a great point, and I th- I feel like it was Comcast's way of going shut the fuck up. You're gonna suck our dick all the, <laughs> as much as we want. Uh, did you get where I was talking about what Tom Merritt said? I didn't hear you mention Tom Merritt. All right, so what I was saying is Tom Merritt basically said this. I've heard him say it the most, which is these these things get more use and and become more successful, the the easier they are for people to use them. Yeah. So Netflix streaming made things really easy. So piracy went down because it was so easy to watch the stuff you wanted through Netflix streaming. Now that it's starting to split up again, you're having to chase content around from Amazon, Netflix, Hulu, and now Disney's got their service starting up and CBS with their things and all this other stuff. It's like it's becoming more of a pain in the ass. And I think piracy is going to start to go up again. And that's going to cause a lot of problems for the the production companies who've gotten kind of used to like people will pay us the 10 bucks a month yeah i'll pay somebody 10 bucks a month but i'm not going to pay five or ten different things 10 bucks a month because then i might as well just have fucking cable this is a good move and the companies that go in on this would be very very smart to do it but i always feel like somebody gets greedy and says oh we can do it better it's like the blu-ray versus hd dvd war again or vhs versus betamax war it's it's always like you've got your thing, we've got our thing. Let's see who wins, and yeah. and it doesn't matter who wins because in the meanwhile somebody's losing. My friend who got the entire Harry Potter series on high definition DVDs at the time has no way of watching those movies after a year because all the support went away and he wasn't going to get any more of the movies as they came out for it. it. It's really frustrating to be the the one who picks the loser, but in reality. It wasn't your fault. It was them just putting a bet and saying, well, we're not going to invest in this because Sony owes the patent on Blu-ray. Yeah. And that's where I, I, I feel like like Beats hitting it pretty good. Uh, you know, to be fair, this service sounds like they are actually trying to do it right. Um, which they it are, does. But, but at the same time, Disney is pulling their stuff out of Netflix. So they're they're doing one thing right while doing another not wrong. It, it's probably best for their business. But for the the people who've already been like, oh, I'm going to Netflix because I'm getting all these Marvel movies and all these Marvel shows and everything else. It's like, well, now you're not going to get that. And also some Marvel shows are coming out on Hulu and Marvel shows are coming out on Freeform and who knows where those will wind up. It's it's not yeah. that they're doing this for everybody yet. It's just they've got the clout to do it right now and get everybody in on their functionary thing. But it, it still it paints them as the powerhouse. Well, I mean, because in a lot of regards, they are. I mean, you know, they... No, they absolutely are. Yeah, because, I mean, they've got... I mean, you think about it, you know, out of a... Out of, you know, like a summer or winter movie draft, uh, you know, with that the Night Attack frame rate uh, Diamond Club guys do, how many of those movies are Disney-owned because they are either Lucasfilm, Marvel, or even Disney themselves? Or Pixar. Or Pixar, you know. I mean, there's a lot of things that they have that it's like, you're you're sort of like, well, wait, wow, this is you know, this is really interesting, um, to think about. Um, yeah, but the the hardest thing about being on top is at some point you get toppled, and it also makes it less of of an importance for you to compete to the same degree that someone else can be much more innovative when they're number three or number five. Uh, on the list instead of number one or number two yeah. those are the ones who can take risks and suddenly steal all of the attention away now i'm not sure when that's going to happen um right now we're seeing companies that should be up at the same level fighting to to hit that level of of disney and and struggling in it because they're they're copying more than they're innovating but at the same time i uh, if, if we're just going DC versus Marvel, the Marvel movies to me are, are better because of how they have a sort of sameness and what DC did of trying to be different didn't work out, in my opinion. 
but I, I still think that when you when you factor in that, okay, one thing is now in control of so many different IPs and is now running the business of they're the streaming service that people are going to want because that's where all the, the really good blockbuster movies are. And on top of that, they're getting all the other people to kind of play ball with them. Then it becomes like Diamond Distributors in, in comics, which is Diamond may have been the best distributor at the time. And so it made sense that everybody kind of went exclusive to them when Marvel tried to open up their own distributorship and just do direct. So we lost Capital City and we lost a bunch of other places. But now you have creators being pissed off and and wanting to sue Diamond because Diamond doesn't have to be good at its job. It's the only game in town. Or like if you're someone who creates, if you do eBooks and stuff and you're doing it through Kindle, you know, Kindle doesn't owe you anything. You know, they can change the rules at any point in time because they set the rules. And who the fuck are you to tell them otherwise? You just be damn glad that they let you put your shit into their ecosystem. Uh, Facebook and pages. It's like, hey, bring all of your internet stuff to us. We're your best connection to people. They're already in Facebook, so come to us and we'll let you talk to your audience here. And then a year later, oh, by the way, if you actually want to talk to your audience here now, who's all gotten used to seeing you here, you have to pay us. You have to give us money to have your shit get seen, even though they said that they want to see your shit. It, it, it's always a problem when something gets too big and does too much. And yeah. Disney so far has been a company that hasn't really let that screw them up, but you just know it's coming. Oh yeah, definitely. So the next news story that we got is that speaking of DC Comics, the DC villain Deathstroke movie is in the works from the Raid director. Um, he did the Raid in the Raid 2, I believe. So uh, Gareth Evans is his name. He is he directed the, the Raid, which I've heard great things about that movie, in all honesty. And Deathstroke is the villain who first appeared in 1980 in the new Teen Titans number 2. The character whose real name is Slade Wilson is an expert assassin with super strength and stamina, and he's been played by Manu Bennett on CW's Arrow. He's been in numerous, you know, cartoon shows. He was the main villain for the Teen Titans cartoon show. And you, you look at this, and there's rumors that he's. I'm not sure if he's confirmed that he's going to be in the Justice League, um, that Deathstroke is, but it was rumored that. Or, well, he was previously cast uh, being played by Joe Mang uh, Manganello, um, or as I like to call him, uh, Flash Thompson in the first Spider Man movie. Which, in all honesty, you look at that picture, you look at the picture of him in there, and then look at him like in Magic Mike or in the de Deathstroke, you're like, they don't look alike. Like, there's, you see some facial stuff, you're like, they look so weird. <laughs> but he's, he was rumored to be in the, the, Ben Affleck starring and directing and written uh, the Batman movie. I don't even think that was a rumor. I think that was confirmed it, for a while yeah. with the first Batman script that Ben Affleck was was co-writer on with Jeff Johns and Ben Affleck at that time was directing. And then it was later on, oh, now I'm not going to direct. And then it was, oh, we're working on a whole new script. And so they cast this guy who was looking so forward to playing this character and suddenly he didn't have a movie anymore. So I'm yeah. I'm glad that they're they're talking about giving him his own film and and while I'm not big on villain movies and Suicide Squad aside, I, I just don't necessarily enjoy watching a movie centered on a villain. I'm not jumping up and down for like a Venom movie, which I also don't think is gonna have anything to do with Spider Man anyways. But Deathstroke is somebody who can who who warrants enough story. It's just that what I remember being introduced to Deathstroke with was the Teen Titans and and the Titans hunt and the the Judas contract and everything else. So if you use it as an establishment to then have him jump off of that into something where he gets to play the villain for something else, it, it probably won't be Titans since they're planning on doing Titans for TV at this point. I can appreciate that this would be something that they would do. And and Joe Meganello Meganiello is uh I haven't seen him in a lot of stuff, but what I've seen him in, I've liked him, and and certainly personally, uh, personality wise, in in his real life, he's cool. Uh, Beat saying True Blood, yeah. Remember, I ain't got time to TV. 
Uh, I, I did. Th- I think True, True Blood. Blood was the first. Ain't got time to TV. Yeah, it was. It was. I only done a couple, and because I ain't got time for that segment. But <laughs> I think he, he's perfectly fine, and and I'm glad that he's going to get the opportunity to play the character. I don't know that this character would have worked in a situation of having him alone go up against the whole Justice League. Although that has been a storyline in the comics before, but it was a it was a slightly different league and it was in a flashback, but it was pretty cool. One of my favorite scenes actually is when all of the Justice League and this is more of a Bronze Age league of I think Elongated Man and the Barry Allen's Flash and Oliver Queen's uh, Green Arrow. Oliver Queen, they're all teamed up on this guy. Zatanna was there and they're all trying to bring him down and Green Arrow was stabbing him in his empty eye socket with one of his arrows. And it was just one of the coolest freaking things in comics at that point. It was like, oh shit, I kind of really dig Green Arrow right now. All that said, the DC film universe we know is still such a weird place. It's so amorphous. It it hasn't really figured out what it's doing from what reports we're getting. Because every week it's like, oh, this character's getting a movie. But it's not really part of the DC film universe. It's just its own side thing. Is it connected? Is it not connected? And you just don't know. And they they keep saying stuff, and it's just so bizarre. And I understand that Marvel probably regrets some of the interconnectivity now with things like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and in humans, especially, because those things don't really work going towards the films. They're, they're not at the same level. I wish Agent Carter would have done more... And certainly I love the show and I, I love Haley Atwell in the role. But because she was utilized in the show, I feel like they kind of got rid of her in the films to a degree. And that's really too bad. I, although her storyline could have just ended in the first Captain America and that would have sucked even worse. Yeah. I just, but I, I see stuff like this and it's, is this character in the same universe as Ben Affleck's Batman anymore? Or is he in the same universe as joss whedon's Batgirl movie or as the proposed nightwing film or any of these other things and this would have been a great thing to do and say hey we're not utilizing you in the batman movie but we'll put you in as the villain in nightwing movie which kind of makes more sense anyways if you go back to the origins of the characters yeah but they're not even doing that so i i just i don't know at this point it's as up in the air as the captain marvel slash shazam film Uh, where we can't call him Captain Marvel anymore. (laughs) I look at this in in a slightly different way. Um, Looking at, you know, looking at the Marvel, because this is what I always give when I'm talking to people about the Marvel Cinematic Universe, is one of the things I love about it is that no two two movies are the same. Um, You know, like, and and we give the example of, you know, you want a heist movie in here with superheroes, you go to Ant-Man. You want a political thriller, you you go to Winter Soldier and all that. I feel like you look at who the director is and what he's really known for with the uh, martial arts film, The Raid, and its sequel, and they both have such unique, ambitious fight sequences. And you know, you look at a lot of the things that he's done, and it's this thing that you know, it could be DC going, all right, let's get different people who are going to tell stories in different ways, to because that's what. Like, like, I think they're realizing now that what made Marvel successful can make them successful too. And, and it's fine that they're, you know, they're using it because we're going to get great stories out of this in theory. And that's do these, do move, don't do a connected universe just to do a connected universe because then you're going to lose track of the characters. You're going to lose track of who these characters are and what they're supposed to be. But yet do a good, you know, a good assassin type movie with you know with you know a uh, death stroke here with a guy who does really ambitious fight sequences and is known for doing you know films that have such ambitious fight sequences as opposed to the target practice ricochet thing that we got with Will Smith's uh dead shot in Suicide Squad. No, I I agree that's that's definitely what I want is to have Films where the characters feel like they're honest to the character that they're starring. I've argued, obviously, that I did not enjoy the the take that Zack Snyder had on on Superman in the DC mm-hmm. film universe. Uh, we'll see what his with Joss Whedon's assistance 
Justice League turns out to be like. I still look at the films and it's all still very muddy and weird to me and doesn't feel like Justice League at all. But I do see a lot more humor and fun in it, which is perfectly okay. I, I'm just... It's going to be hard for me to become satisfied with with where these things have started. Yeah. But at the same time, yeah, absolutely. A If you're saying, oh, we want to do a Deathstroke film, it's one, it's strange to me that that's a movie that you're you're kind of putting out so early, but then so is Suicide Squad, and, and so are some of the other choices, and, and none of them are bad. And if you're going to do it, then this seems like a good opportunity to do something with, with Deathstroke. I just also want to remind you that what works about Marvel is not just that all of the films, not all of them, but most of the films are different or or have different styles, but they can still have the same characters be in those different films with each other, and they still make sense. It, it, yeah. Captain America is in the political thriller of Winter Soldier, and he's in the, the classic feeling... Of, of World War II in the first Avenger, and then he's in the Avengers movies, and he feels consistent to himself all the way across the board, but then the way that he's utilized because of the different situations and the different films he's in feels honest too, and, and they all get to be their own thing while still being true to him, being true to Iron Man, being true to Thor, uh, and Black Widow and all of them, and I love that. And so it's not just, oh, we need... A character to plug into this okay well we're gonna put the hulk here well the hulk makes no sense at all because this totally goes against his nature and his demeanor and everything else well it, it doesn't matter because we've got the hulk we're gonna use the hulk okay i really felt like the story called for say valkyrie but sure now we're making it a hulk story uh yeah. which is not to, to put any slams on Thor ragnarok which looks awesome but again, Thor, you see Thor oh, in the yeah. first two Thor movies. Very different movies from at least what we've seen so far of Thor Ragnarok. Yet mm -hmm. you look at Thor Ragnarok and you think, but this is the Thor that I follow all the way across. I don't see him as a different character. I just see this as a progression into something else that looks a lot more fun, which is great, which is absolutely great. I hope that DC lands this stuff. I, I really want them to succeed. Again, I've always been a DC person more than a Marvel person when it came to the comics and the characters. One of the things that DC was talking about years ago, before I think even Marvel had their movies uh, starting up or taking off yet, there was supposed to be a Green Arrow film called Supermax. And it was Green Arrow wound up in a prison with a whole bunch of supervillains. I still kind of long to see that movie because it doesn't, take anything away from who Green Arrow is. It's not like this couldn't happen to the character in any kind of regular comic storyline. It just seemed like a great situation of taking a superhero, putting him in that, and it sidesteps the we have to get his origin story. It sidesteps all these tropes that superhero movies were already, we had built up expectations of what they were. This is another thing where I could have seen that working. Yeah. And Suicide Squad on paper was a perfectly good idea to to try to do when it gave them an opportunity to do something that hadn't been done before. Yeah, that's it's, that's sort of where I I feel like DC's trying to do, you know, instead of setting up their heroes because then it's like we would then need like need or be expecting backstory doing villain pieces that have hints of the heroes in there eliminates that need that's what i'm getting at with or feeling like is happening with these whole you know because we've got we got the flash and we got batman in in suicide squad theoretically we would get batman or nightwing or you know uh you know some of the other teen titans in a deathstroke movie depending on how they want to do it of course to where it would help alleviate you know, to again to compare it to Marvel, one of the reasons why Spider Man Homecoming is my favorite movie is they didn't do the origin. It's a selfish reason on my part, but when you've seen Uncle Ben die twice and you've seen two different actors ugly cry, well, Toby Maguire cry and then 
Andrew Garfield, I believe he did more ugly crying with Uncle Ben dying. You're like, well, do we need to see it again? No. And yeah, so they, like they distilled everything that you you love from Spider Man, and and they got rid of the the excess that you would normally need to tell that story. It it, it the yeah. classic. I told you that story, so I could tell you this one. And yeah. and at this point in time, it's like, no, just tell me the good one. Uh, it get rid of the the prologue. Just get me to the 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 hits, and and make that happen. And I would probably be far less critical of this if I didn't feel such disappointment in the DC film universe so far. And so I have to adjust my thought process because every new movie that they do is still an opportunity for them to prove themselves. And it, it's far yeah. better to look at it that way than it is to say something like every new movie that Marvel does is, is me waiting to see them screw it up. I, I would rather see success than failure. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm a guy who rants and does reviews online, uh, <laughs> it's amazing to think that that's a possibility that I'd be rooting for somebody. I have to see that first thing that pulls me in happen before I can be more behind it. Uh, yeah. and, and I would argue to some degree that Wonder Woman was that. I didn't love Wonder Woman as much as I had hoped to, but the the problems I had with it were far fewer and far lesser than what I was having with the other DC movies. And and mm -hmm. even before that, Suicide Squad, to me, had a lot of things that I enjoyed, even though I thought it was a terrible movie and not, not at all concurrent with, with the characters themselves in some ways. In other ways, it was. But it just kind of all comes together into a big old mess and and beat is mentioning that it was 20 minutes too long uh i guess if they had cut out the video game openers for all the characters <laughs> uh only the characters that mattered and the one that you know that didn't matter didn't get a video game opener and died five minutes into being on screen uh yeah i i can i can piss a moan about what they've done in the past uh but i it's better to acknowledge that even as far back as Suicide Squad, I felt like maybe they were moving in the right direction. And yeah. it's possible that my my frustrations really all stem from the the creative force behind those first two movies, who is still a part of this upcoming movie. And that's going to be not so much a strike against it, but a, a, a problem for me, possibly, of, of enjoying it. And I don't want to... I don't want to say that he's incapable of making a good film, because there were parts there that were there before we saw Joss Whedon get involved with it that looked like it could have been on the right track. We just have to see where that track actually leads us. I feel like I want to end on this. I've talked with this about Justice League with other people, um, you know, people at my church. And because of the situations that happened and, you know, Joss Whedon stepping in to help you know, finish this, finish the movie, uh, you know, like finish principal photography and reshoots or whatever it was. I feel like a lot of people are going, especially with how a lot of the TV spots are going, where you're seeing a lot more quips and humor in the, in the movie. There's a big part of me that with interviews or behind the scenes, you know, on the DVD where, or, you know, like, like the like director's commentary, which honestly, I would love to hear that director's commentary of Joss Whedon and Zack Snyder talking about this movie, but that's just me because you know, like you know, I, where I I agree with you on a lot of the things, but I still respect Zack Snyder for what he does here. You know, where it, it it might not be good and it might not hit. You know, it might make me mad, but to hear him explain what he was going through, what his thought process was with shooting the scenes, and then to go when it gets to a funny po point, and he's like it was a good line you know it was it was an ad lib or something like this and you go wait wait that wasn't joss whedon because i feel like a lot of people would assume that a lot of the humor is going to be joss whedon yeah they're gonna they're gonna say the the good stuff is joss and the bad stuff is Zach, or or the opposite because if you're the yeah. person who enjoyed those those first two films you may feel that joss whedon is going to come in and screw it up because maybe you're a person who doesn't enjoy 
the Avengers movies or you don't like Joss's work from before. You don't like all the the snap comedy and and one liners or whatever else or the the Scooby gang from Buffy way back. It it depends on your taste. And so when you've got two different very different feeling filmmakers making something in in congruity with each other, it's going to be challenging and and someone's going to want to tear it apart and say who did what. Yeah. And and I I like your idea of having commentary with both of them because I I would like to see the respect paid to Zack Snyder for doing so much of what he did in this film because he did launch it. And for, for good or ill, whatever your opinion, he put a lot of work into it and, and only left it because of horrifyingly bad experiences in his private life. And it would be nice to see him get to, to reap some of the rewards from it for however it it comes out. But I will say, There, there's something to be said for between the Hulk movie by Ang Lee and the Incredible Hulk movie co-produced with Marvel with Universal. I, I don't even know who it was who directed it, but they knew what to leave and what to take. And and again, by the time we got to Avengers and the Hulk and that same thing, they knew what to leave and they knew what to take. They even brought back Thunderbolt Ross from the Incredible Hulk to have in the the Civil War movie. Louis Leterrier. It's, 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 the yeah, it, it's picking the, the good and knowing when to leave the stuff that didn't work. So maybe you don't feel like you have to go back and watch that Ang Lee Hulk movie to get your whole Hulk story. Just give us enough to, to have us move forward. And that's, like you said, with the Spider-Man thing, is we all know Spider-Man. We know that this isn't the same Spider-Man but we don't have to pick through the same Spider-Man stories again to get to what makes a good Spider-Man story now. Yeah. And and if going forward, DC's film universe decides that they want to see changes in the way that Justice League is used or Superman is used or Batman is used, then they don't have to be beholden to what came before it. Yeah. All right. So the next news story... Hey, guess what? It has a difficult name in the first in the first line of the article. So, pre-warning: if I butcher your name, I apologize. But Beetlejuice Two is being pushed forward with a new writer at Warner Brothers. For those of you guys who do not know, Beetlejuice uh, was directed by Tim Burton in 1988 and became a cult a cult favorite. It was it actually it was it was re-released in two theaters in Los Angeles now. But Mike Vuk. Vukadovanovich, sorry, Vukadovanovich. Yeah, Vukadovanovich um, will rewrite uh, Beetlejuice two for uh, for Warner Brothers, a project that will be uh, that has been gestating and has been a repairing of Tim Burton and Michael Keaton. Although, I guess they are both working on a Dumbo movie at Di- uh, at Disney, um, so they're that's their repairing, I guess, but not in the classic sense. The, the cool thing with this is I look at, you know, because the article gives, you know, what uh, Vukedovich, you know, he, he's done. He's done a movie called uh, Rememory, a science fiction drama that premiered at Sundance earlier this year and is required by Lionsgate. And this is the movie that stars Peter Dinklage and Julie Ormond, Ormond. which Ormond, sorry. Well, I, I get v- Vukedovich his name right and I butcher hers. Wow. How does you're, that work? You're just assuming you got his name right. I just I know oh, Julia Armand's name how it's yeah. pronounced so that that's why oh, I'm giving that to you. <laughs> but it's which I've seen a lot. I've seen some trailers for it. I'm like that looks really good, and I've even I've even seen it at my store. I just haven't bought it yet. I don't know, so what do you think about this? Uh, because to be honest, this was released a year before I was born. Uh, for those of you guys who had an hour in, this is where I made Corey feel old. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been struggling. Anyways, uh, last night we had Anthony Rouse on as our guest on Podcast of Terror. He is 22 and he is a filmmaker and he just works his ass off and is prolific, just making stuff all the time and and made Matt feel old, which <laughs> which just made me look like 
Alec Baldwin and Gina Davis at the end of Beetlejuice when they're turning to dust in front of everybody. How do I feel about this? Beetlejuice is a beloved classic for me. And we're talking about something that really launched the career of Winona Ryder. Mm -hmm. Was considered the first breakout hit for Tim Burton, even though he had done Pee Wee's Big Adventure before that and and was a spectacular movie in its own right. But people always think about Pee Wee's Big Adventure as Paul Rubin's Pee Wee Herman thing, not as much about Tim Burton's thing. This was when we got Tim Burton and we started to see who Tim Burton really was as a filmmaker and got his aesthetic and everything going forward and where we're going to go with Edward Scissorhands, your favorite horror movie, and uh, Batman, which utilized Michael Keaton. This was also a big launch for Michael Keaton, not in the fact that he hadn't been in movies before and wasn't already become a big, well-known actor, but when we got to see him do something completely outside the realm of what we had been seeing before. He was doing very good comedies. I, I loved him. The first time I saw him was in a movie called Night Shift with mm -hmm. Shelley Long and uh and Fonzie and then he was in Mr. Mom and uh, a couple other things Gung Ho I think but when we got to Beetlejuice it's like he was unrecognizable from himself he was playing this character fully immersed into it and we're like oh wow shit Michael Keaton could do something very very different and so when it came up after that that he was doing Batman the same sort of thing of, oh, shit. I would have never thought of Michael Keaton as Batman. It, it, it doesn't work in the in the conscious mind. But when you take a step back and you look at it, and it's like, oh, but it could work. He can do it. it. It meant he was more capable than what we had seen. And so in a lot of ways, this movie is, is one of those things that you don't want to see get fucked up. Uh, like you don't want to see them wreck ghostbusters by doing a relaunch of it with people who weren't the original ghostbusters and you can make your arguments that it was it wasn't the actresses and i agree that it wasn't the actresses the actresses are all very capable of many other things but because it wasn't the ghostbusters that we recognized and on top of that i don't think it was the funniest movie in the world it needed yeah. to be to win the audience over when you do something that so many years later it's always a crapshoot of if that audience, the original audience is going to return. And if they return strictly for the nostalgia, do you only give them a nostalgic film or do you give them a new film that's going to cover new ground and new territory? And which is the better option, really? Because if it's nostalgia for nostalgia's sake, it's kind of cheap. You feel kind of cheapened out. It's like, oh, you're just doing the same beats over again. And, and here's... Here's the young girl that's replacing Lydia. Maybe it's Lydia's daughter. Maybe we get Winona Ryder back for this. Uh, or or the, the ghosts are all still living in the house. What do we do? I don't imagine that uh, Jeffrey Jones is going to come back from this. He's probably not around, allowed around children. But there's so many things that... What is the story going to be? Who is it going to involve? Is it just Beetlejuice himself in a whole new situation? And that's up to the, the screenwriter and, and the director and everything. Again, it, it's 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 hard to say at this point without knowing anything other than the fact that they're hoping to do a Beetlejuice too. I certainly think Michael Keaton can pull it off. Yeah, whatever I mean, it is, he seems up for any role at this point. Yeah, I mean it's which which is cool. I mean, also I should point out that Seth Graham Smith and David Katzenberg of Cat Smith Katz Smith uh, Productions will produce this. All in all, I. I think this is pretty cool, and we should also point out that this, much like the article about the Deathstroke movie, uh, there are no deals set for Tim Burton or Michael Keaton yet, so they haven't signed anything. Same thing with uh, Joe Manganiello and uh, the uh, the, dire the director. I'm blanking on his name because I closed the tab. I don't know. I, I feel like I just felt like this was an interesting story to have in here because you get it's like, your what if. It's your yeah. what if situation. It's it's man, I love Beetlejuice. I wish we had gotten more Beetlejuice. Other than the cartoon, the cartoon was actually really good too. Yeah. Oh man, if we had gotten a, a Beetlejuice two, twenty years ago, it, who knows? Because we we got a, a Ghostbusters two, and and people will will tell you 
and they'd be right. Ghostbusters two was not was not a good movie, yeah. especially as a follow up to Ghostbusters. But in hindsight, I love Ghostbusters two because it was the sequel to Ghostbusters, and it had the whole team mm-hmm. back together, and it and it it had its moments. I guess I guess this sort of brings up an interesting question that we're we're sort of going around here. Can a movie show, you know, property that's reached cult status, can it come back and do better than what it originally did? It depends on the goodwill. It depends on the goodwill of the audience and and how they feel about you. For instance, we just had our fifth Pirates of the Caribbean movie. Now, the, those first three Pirates movies did amazing. The fourth one came out, and I don't think anybody even remembers what it's about. It just didn't have Will and uh, Keira Knightley's character. I can't think of her name, but Elizabeth. Elizabeth, thank you. And the Only fifth one came out playing the Lego game. <laughs> yeah, and the fifth one came out and did nothing. But if the goodwill had still been there for for the creators, and and I think Johnny Depp is not in a place where people are really loving Johnny Depp right now. Maybe it could have done better. You look at Twin Peaks, the revival on Showtime. And even though it was nothing like the original Twin Peaks TV series, uh, it had far more in common with the Twin Peaks movie and was just, let's face it, purely David Lynch. It was Lynch at his lynchiest. People were super excited for it. Now, I think some people went away disappointed because they liked the show. I liked the show. I liked the books based off the show. Uh, I liked the soap opera silliness. So I'm not sure how I'm going to react to the the new series yet. I still haven't watched it. I'm I'm waiting to get to that. But some people loved it because of the art and because it did give us a follow up to characters that we love like Dale Cooper. Yeah. And and it was a payoff for something that we'd waited 20 years for and that's great so it it really depends on how do you earn the trust of the people to get them to want to come back i think we've seen that uh michael keaton is blowing up in hollywood again ever since birdman uh he's he's doing more and more interesting parts he's doing stuff that aren't as well known as birdman in the drama categories but people are excited to see him back up on the screen and i think that we are certain that he can give us good stuff. Tim Burton's yeah. a little bit more of a crapshoot because one, he works a lot with Johnny Depp uh, and and got a little too enamored of doing movies with him and uh, his now ex-wife, Helena Bonham Carter. But sometimes he does okay, but he really got into doing the same kind of look of things for a while of the Alice in Wonderland movie and, and a bunch of other stuff. We watched his... Uh, Miss Peregrine's school for Peculiar whatever. Peregrine. Yeah. And it seemed like it was all artsy and no story. So it's kind of 50-50 on this for me. Yeah. And 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 where it's going to, I think, land in the positive is because, again, Beetlejuice is very, very beloved. But where it can land in the negative is... But it, that's not my Beetlejuice. There's no Lydia. There's no... There's no Gene Davis and Alec Baldwin in the attic. There, what is this? Why do they even do that movie? So you really have to walk a line, and and then it becomes a, a Star Wars. Not what is the first one of the new movies? Uh, the of the you know Rogue One or not Rogue uh, One? For, Force Awakens. Force Awakens. Yeah, it, it's a Star Wars Force Awakens situation where. It tells the same story to a certain degree, and people are going to yeah. complain. Oh, they're just repeating themselves. They're just giving us episode four over again. But at the same time, it was hugely successful because they gave us episode four over again. And remember how great episode four was when we first saw it? What they didn't give us was the prequels. And so thank you for that. <laughs> I don't know. It's, so, it's I- so early. It's hard to say. As I keep seeing Peter Dinklage's name in, in the article... I really want to see Peter Dinklage in the movie. Like maybe it's the new Otho. Uh, that would be tremendous. Uh, I, I think Peter Dinklage is somebody who who should be in a Beetlejuice film anyways. The next story, there's talks of the team who did Logan 
the team that did Logan, the the Wolverine movie from was it last year or was it this year? Uh this past year. It was very recent. Uh yeah. they are looking at doing a Laura spin-off and the uh it says finding the drama in Wolverine's goodbye. Laura was the character X23 from the comics who replaced Wolverine in the comics up until well she still is Wolverine right now but we have seen the return of Logan in the comics uh very recently mm-hmm. and she her character survives whereas Hugh Jackman's version of Logan doesn't so they have an intent now of doing a spin-off film with her character and kind of being the continuation of maybe Logan's themes, Wolverine's themes, which is not with the X-Men. And his his standalone movies have been all over the map. If you go back to X-Men Origins Wolverine, don't. And then if you go to the Wolverine movie, maybe you don't do that one either. If you, if you just go to Logan, well, Logan's going to kind of rely on you seeing all the crap that came before it, honestly. Uh, yeah. It's, but so it was a much here, better take on, on everything. Yeah, here's here's honestly what I would say with Logan. You you have a movie, you have an X Men movie, you have a Wolverine movie that it takes. It is a Logan who has seen a bunch of shit. Has you know has everything every all the other previous X Men movies has happened to him. Yeah, I would be weary too. Yeah, he I is, feel like that from watching it. Yeah, he is weary. He is, but one like I personally, I loved Logan. I love like I loved the tone. I am a little bit surprised because I haven't. I have. I bought. I bought it in 4K. I have not seen the 4K copy yet, or the Logan Noir where they did the whole thing in black and white. And then with this, like, I loved the the uh, Laura Kinney character played by Daphne Keene, and. One of the things that I th- I think is really interesting is you have the one of the creators of X twenty three, uh, Craig Kyle, um, who he, he created Laura for the two thousand three uh, two thousand three animated TV series X Men Evolution, which I loved when I was fourteen. He is working on the script with Mangold, the director of the of the movie, and also worked on a little project you might have heard about coming out next week called Thor Ragnarok. Don't know if it's going to be a big hit or not. But we really um, don't know. <laughs> and so I look at this and it's a lot of this stuff for the X-Men's side is that I would echo a lot of the things that we had with the DC side. And that's look at, you know, Fox has to look at the characters that they have and figure out what type of movie is going to be good. Because right now, like honestly, what I would picture with a a Laura movie, whether it's called Laura or X23 or whatever it is, I would picture be a, you know, Generation X or, you know, a, like a New Mutants but not the New Mutants. You know, like like because, basically because they're doing the New Mutants. Yeah, because they're doing the New Mutants in a horror movie. But they, they do introduce her to a whole other group of mutant children at the yeah. end of Logan, which means that if they wanted to follow up in that regard, they can. It just feels like it would be a it would be the same thing. It would yeah. be she ran all this way to get with this group of kids to escape and to to be free. And then if it's and now here they are. And they're still all out in the woods and they're trying to be free, but something comes and fucks it up, then it's just the same thing. My first thought is because in two days we have the return of one of my belo- most beloved shows from last year, Stranger Things. And the idea of Laura as a character interacting with normal kids in the way that Eleven does in the first season of Stranger Things works for me yeah it, it would be it would be a copy of something that already exists but stranger things owes so many things to other stuff anyways but it's a very easy to, thing to do to have it, it it goes back to the uh the return to witch mountain movies that i watched in the 70s it, how do you utilize this character who do you introduce her to you can't have her just be running around with a bunch of other mutants because that's the x-men films 
Uh, you can't have them running around the woods because that's the end of Logan. You can't put them into a straight-up horror movie because that's what they're doing with New Mutants. So what's the next step? What do you do to utilize her? And she is still young. So you've got to put her in a situation that makes sense for this actress in this version of the character. If they bring the actress back, which I would like to think that they would. But if they decide that they want to age her, and that's the other part, is that in this sense, Logan already takes place in the future of now, mm -hmm. whereas the X-Men movies are taking place decades in the past. No idea when New Mutants is taking place. Deadpool don't give a fuck and is about to inherit a time-traveling mutant anyways, so what's it matter? I, I really... I don't care about the interconnectivity of the X-Men universe because it's such a shithole place to try to make sense of because the person who's been in charge of the X-Men movies overall doesn't give a fuck about the continuity of the universe. They just yeah. keep throwing, like, hey, you just like, see this character played by one actor in one movie? Here's the character again in this other movie played by a completely different actor, and it, it doesn't make any sense at all <laughs> that he's acting like he does here compared to what he did just here. Who cares? Fuck it. Fuck yeah. it all. You know, <laughs> just... And I, I think part of it is, you know, like, uh, Beatmaster's pulling a quote here that uh, Hugh Jackman said, no, I won't be a producer on a Laura sequel, but I will be lining up on the Thursday night at 10 p.m. to watch it, though. She is yeah, just because, phenomenal. It's, because Hugh it's Jackman really, is stellar, and, yeah. and he knows it's not about him. No, He yeah. had the opportunity for it to be about him, and he's like, I'm done playing the character. I would like to see the character continue with another actor, much in the way that a James Bond does. Uh, I would love to see Laura continue with her, stories and arc and and i support the actress he he's an excellent guy and that is absolutely the right tack to take for yeah. him although they could easily throw him into the past in some of the other x-men stuff still if he chose to back into it it, it it doesn't really matter we we've seen we've seen actors get replaced in movies and marvel movies and and shrugged it off not the main characters so far but but very important secondary characters uh in the case of say Terrence Howard becoming Don Cheadle as as Rhodey. Wolverine would be harder to replace because so much is hinged on his character and Jackman's portrayal since the beginning of the X-Men films. At some point we we changed Mystique's and now Mystique is in every goddamn film for no reason. Uh we've changed Magneto's and he's in every goddamn film for no reason. But we can handle it. It's just if you think too hard about it then you just don't get to enjoy the movies for what they are. I just don't really enjoy the movies for what they are. Yeah. So it, it's it's one more stab at why I'm not enjoying them. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, I look at this and I go, like, I know that these, that, you know, the guys who are doing it, one, we've got the creator of the character. Who else better to know the character than the one who created this character? Well, no, like, absolutely I'll true. Absolutely true, but it's like seeing Stan Lee write a Spider-Man movie. I'm just expe except expecting to hear Excelsior a lot. Yeah, uh, that's that's <laughs> what I mean. Is that Stan Lee created so many of the the Marvel universe heroes with with Jack Kirby or <laughs> or other people, Steve Ditko, and wrote and sold millions and millions of comics, and is well deserved to be considered the one of the fathers of of modern comics period there's no arguing yeah. that at all but stan lee writing a spider-man movie probably not going to be the success that spider-man has been in any of the incarnations that have come out on the big screen because while stan lee created the character his storytelling doesn't match up with what modern audiences want in a film. I'm not saying that that uh, Kyle is is in that same boat, but I'm just saying that we can't automatically assume that the person who creates something is necessarily the best storyteller to keep going forward with them. Sometimes these characters become more successful when other people pick them up. Wolverine yeah. was introduced as a a sort of foe to the Hulk. And then wound up getting used in the X Men and became super popular there. And the X Men themselves became popular under the writing of Chris Claremont versus Stanley creating them in the first run. 
Yeah. So the, comics have benefited from the amount of, of various creators that have worked on them over the years. And while I, I always insist that you have to be true to the character, obviously growth happens because of the changes that, that are introduced by each different person's take on a Batman or a Superman or a Wonder Woman or whatever. You know, just because but, but, the guy who created Wonder Woman is the guy who created Wonder Woman, the stories that were done by George Perez or Gail Simone or Greg Rucka or any other number of creators are the ones that we favorably think of more in relation to who the Wonder Woman is that we think of today. But, true. But what I'm getting at is because you don't see a um oh i'm trying to think i think kelly thompson is currently writing all new wolverine um well, actually i think i have <laughs> one of my dogs um i could have checked but and you don't see these people who have written you know like new york x and everything that has used laura um you know charles uh, sewell has used it has used her joe casada wrote new york x actually uh, yeah, uh joe casada and all but so you don't see them helping with the treatment so what i'm saying is you're like like it, it makes it does in my opinion it does make sense that they've that they that the guy who wrote on thor ragnarok wrote oh yeah you know, no no absolutely created, but just remember yeah mark guggenheim if i recall correctly was one of the writers for green lantern and this morning i took a shit what's your point uh, it, it, sometimes people <laughs> take a shit sometimes people <laughs> take a shit the the best writers can write bad things. Uh, Berlanti, oh, yeah. Greg Berlanti is is yeah, and 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 Jeff Johns was involved. So it, you can be a really great creator and still make a crap film. So, so just so by, so but, just be aware that. But no, yeah, but we're again we're at the beginning of this. We don't even know what the movie's about. We don't even know if the movie's going to be a movie. We have to it's, see what what changed was people's perception of Logan changed when they saw that movie trailer hit mm -hmm. and, and it had such a different flavor and it felt like a smart progression of, okay, this is going to be our final Wolverine movie. This looks like this could be a really good final Wolverine movie. If that's yeah. the story that they choose to tell, but how many times have we gone in thinking, Oh, there's going to be this movie about this character that I really dig. And then gone, what the shit were they thinking? You know, it, you, you just you have to be prepared for for anything at this point it, i i know it's it's dumb we're we're no yeah we're pontificating about oh there could be a a laura movie well first of all they're probably not going to call her laura that'd be weird <laughs> um but 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 an x23 movie or or wolverine jr or whatever they're going to call her okay all new wolverine so so what is that going to look like yeah you know what is what is that going to be i don't know and and also, I mean, to point out, because uh, Growly Bear asked, you know, how old will Daphne Keen be? At this point, we don't really know because she, um, right now she is 11 or 12 years old. She's, you know, she's a, you know, preteen, you know, becoming a teenager. So it's like if they get the script out and it goes right now. So I think that's the other part that they are playing into is what type of story do they want to tell? Do they want to tell a you know like some of the other stories that they've told in the comics where it's you know where she's a prostitute probably not but you know a lot of it's going to be like they're you know they're, they're gonna have to take into it to the account of the the, the girl is aging the girl is going to get older so i think that's going to take take some part into it as well but yeah that should be a good point to end the news uh also now that Corey is back and before we get on to the uh the else else views god it's been a while since i forgot what the topics were <laughs> um we should let you guys know that you can help support the show much like growly bear does um i don't think we've said his name enough you know so i'm gonna say it some more you know, and you can go over to gncasts.com slash support and on there you will find our patreon page it's also available at patreon.com slash galactic netcasts and for as little as one dollar you can support the show. You can help us, you know, support the network, you know, help us keep, keep going, keep doing what we love doing. And there are rewards on there. I was just on the Peter Fisher's applicably app review 
thing in which I talked about exploding kittens and snuck in the comic book reader that I use for the comics that are turned or turned by other moons, uh, Comic Cat, and that's a show that you only get on Patreon. So you know, very simply, you know, go over there, Patreon.com/slash Galactic Netcasts, and that helps us out. That helps the network out. And it, quickly before I get into there, a way you can help us out is by going to bit.ly slash en survey 2017 en and s are all capitalized um in there it is a i believe a five question uh thing in which you tell us what you liked about the show what you didn't like about the show what you want to see changed um basically how can we make the show better and we will do our best to accommodate those now if you say get rid of the bearded guys we'll be like so we shave, right? <laughs> Not um, gonna happen. Yeah, uh, yeah. My chin just can't support that kind of treachery. Nope. You said that I want to make a wrestling reference so bad, <laughs> uh, but I knew you wouldn't get it. Um, but no. So I mean, in all honesty, you know, go go to there. Um, we'll have it in our show notes, and just let us know what you want, what you what you think. You know, help us make the show better. What you really, really want. Yeah. So tell us what you want, what you really, really want. I'm just trying to get KFC to follow me on Twitter. <laughs> so yeah, it is time for the else views. This is the point of the show, the section of the show where we talk about the movies, TV shows, video games, comic books, um, you know, everything that is on our nerdy little hearts that we want to talk about a little bit more in depth. I'm gonna do. I'm actually okay. So I picked a couple comic books. These are older comic books. The one is uh one has issue three out right now as of recording this on wednesday the 25th um and i'm gonna start with that one because both these honestly i think Corey, you would love one is a nightwing book it is called nightwing new world order this is both of these are elseworlds books with uh so nightwing new world order is about an older night uh, an older dick grayson who has defeated the superheroes he has made it he has helped pass a law in the in the u.s where it is illegal to have superpowers you either have you either use an inhibitor uh you know shots thing or you are sedated until you the uh inhibitor can be made for you or you join the quote-unquote justice league and use your powers for the state's good it is a really interesting story. I'm blanking on who's who created it, who's like the writers and artist team on here, but the art style is really good. Um, I I'm enjoying it. Uh, they've done three issues out so far. The cool part is, so Corey, I'll tell you right now. That's the premise of basically the first issue. Can you can you guess how the issue ends? Keeping uh, in mind he has a son. Dick Grayson has. My a Little son. Pony shows up and they ride away into the night. No, because this is a six issue series, so that would give us nothing for two through five or two through six. Well, then um, I can last a really long time. Yeah. In all honesty, I did predict the ending of issue one, but I'm like, all right, it makes sense. He comes in to his son's room and he finds him using superpowers. Turns out Dick Grayson, which it's not really hit at at all in the first issue, he is married to Starfire, a drugged you know to where her powers do not work starfire um and they have a a son and he's, he's going through some changes and he has an issue too as you find out powers that are more powerful than starfire and starfire is a pretty powerful character so i have not read issue three but from these first two issues and i'm assuming you pulled up who the creative team is uh, Kyle Higgins is the writer. Trevor McCarthy yep. is the artist. Yeah, and it, it's a really interesting story. I'm, I, I'm really excited to see where it goes, just because of the fact that this is an interesting concept that, of course, we have seen in other, you know, other you know mediums with other characters. It, it sounds sort of like we're seeing it right now in X Men's uh, Gifted series. Yeah, yeah, it, it, and yeah, in, in a lot of ways, we are. The other one that I'm going to talk about, and then, uh, Corey, if you got anything you want to share, you can feel free to share, is Batman White Knights. Now, this is truly billed as an Elseworlds story. 
This is written and drawn by Sean Murphy, who did um, the art for Tokyo Ghoul, or sorry, Tokyo Ghost over at Image with Brian K. Vaughn. No, Rick Remender. Sorry, with Rick Remender. And this is a, a Gotham where Batman has gone too far. And it is up to the Joker, a, a newly reformed Joker, to save Gotham. So in this issue, and I've only read the first issue, I'm not, I don't, I think there's six issues in this one too. You see Batman just running down. Like, it's like, if you thought the end battle of Man of Steel was bad, where, you know, you've got Superman and Zod going through buildings, that's nothing with this, you know, with this chase with Batgirl, Barbara Gordon in the car with Batman. And you just see him. Uh, uh, like he doesn't care he just wants to get the joker and he tries to kill the joker by force feeding him pills it has the ill effect well i'm using ill effect here of because it didn't do what he wanted it to do it actually cures the joker of his insanity he is now joe napier is who he is now and this is not jack napier no, J- yeah, sorry, Jack Napier. Okay. He, he is now Jack Napier. And we're having to go to him to help save Gotham from Batman. Um, this is a really interesting story. I love the art style. Um, Tokyo Ghost is one of my favorite image series. I actually wish there was more of it, but I understand, you know, they told the story they wanted to tell. And I love this artwork for this. It is such a such a compelling story and you know it's one of those that you he gets away with it because he both wrote and drew the the book so he could sort of play it out a little bit better than you know a writer than telling an artist what to do or you know how he sort of sees the scene and then the artist giving his interpretation and stuff like that but there's so much stuff in here like i i think what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna read them as they're going and then once i get issue six or whatever the last issue is reread straight through just so i could pick up like like pick up on anything else that i might have missed it's a seven issue series seven issues sorry so yeah seven issues and then you know go through and read it i gosh both these books i've loved and also i feel like this is a little bit guilt for not putting out any pull lists the past three weeks (laughs) um but yeah so those are some of the things that i've been doing you know while over these past you know while we've been off off the air while Corey's been, you know, watering his lawn so the fires don't engulf his house. No, no, we we can't use water in California. Remember, we're, we're drought friendly, so so <laughs> you, you just gonna have to stand there and hope. Just use your go. tears. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but yeah, so Corey, you got anything you want to share? Yeah, I haven't made it through the entire series yet. This one kind of snuck up on me. Uh, it's a Netflix series. It's from David Fincher, who uh, I know from from doing Seven back in the day. It's called Mind Hunter, and I feel like it snuck up on a lot of people. I don't think people were really expecting this thing, and, and what it is. It is a series about the guy who basically oh Fight Club, thanks Pete, who who basically termed serial killer and put it into the general zeitgeist and was the first one to study the minds of people who were doing mass murders not mass murders at like a bunch of time but like continuously going out and killing and having a pattern is around the time of the son of sam killer there is references to charles manson in this and he winds up interviewing in prison a guy uh, who was out here in in Folsom at the time the co-ed killer And he's trying to discover why these people do these things because they're not motives that had generally been thought of. You thought of motives of jealousy, of of money, of finding uh, finding someone that you loved, having an affair. These things that were easy to understand. You you didn't necessarily agree with with what they did, but you you understood what went through their heads to do this. And he was seeing killers that didn't fit those motives. And so he was trying to figure out why and what made them do these things. 
and we've watched the first three or four episodes so far. The first episode is very much set up and and also does not shy away from just random sex uh, between him and his girlfriend. But by the time you get in the second episode and he goes and he meets the co-ed killer, the co-ed killer is a hugely interesting character in this because he was hanging out in a bar with a bunch of cops and he was killing people. And at one point he becomes a suspect, but the cops don't suspect him even though he he's on their list because they like him too much. He is so jovial and friendly and someone that you just kind of want to sit and talk with that. They're just like, nah, it, it can't be him. And so he actually winds up, after killing his mother, turning himself in because he knew he was never going to get caught. And he knows that he is fucked up. And he, he says, he basically says, yeah, the best thing you could do with me is give me a lobotomy and and drill this this thing out of my head that makes me this way. And And the guy asks him, well, what if that doesn't work? Then you should put me down like a rabid dog and what we've seen so far of the film or the the series it does seem to be leading to they're going to discover another serial killer coming up we're, we're seeing scenes here and there where they're introducing us to someone that you know is is either about to snap or is about to start going on to his his like i'm killing people and this way and everything else but we haven't gotten there yet so it's a lot of just discussion and and this guy in the FBI and another person who's with him who didn't really buy into it, but is starting to kind of see, oh, there maybe is something in this stuff you're saying. Them trying to convince the heads of the FBI to let them pursue this because the FBI isn't really into the psychology. They just want to stop the crimes. The cops aren't into the psychology. They just want to stop the crimes. And the, the main character is not likable. He's kind of, he's so into what he's trying to follow that he doesn't see the the personality of it in that it creeps other people out or it makes them distrust and dislike him so at one point he's in a room full of cops and he puts a slide of charles manson up on the screen and he's trying to talk about charles manson and in some ways empathize with him to say well why is he this way and he had a really hard upbringing and he had all these things that were against him and he's trying to basically say he was made to be this person None of the cops want to hear this. And one of the cops was part of the group that that was around when Manson got pulled in. He, he wasn't there when it happened, but he knew guys that were there when it happened. And he understands all this stuff. So he's he's saying, like, you're fucked up if you try to get in this person's head because there's nothing that you can find there. He's just he's like possessed by the devil or something. But he does come to them later on and says, I have this other case right now. I came to this town because of the fucked up things that I saw in regards to the Manson. I thought this place is so small. We're never going to see something like this, but now we're seeing something like this. What do we do? And they don't have answers yet. They don't understand enough to be able to solve this yet, but it it's this journey and this journey is very interesting. And, and like I said, that character as grotesque as it is, and it makes you very uncomfortable because he's talking about the acts of what he did to these women uh, and to his his mother, and it's gross, but it is so fascinating, and the person playing him is so uncannily good. And my wife said, "Like, is this guy even real?" And she goes and she looks so much like, "Oh shit, he's very real." And whoever's playing him is doing an amazing job of it. <laughs> uh, it's like he's electric; you just can't stop watching him. And at the same time, you want to stop watching him because it's sickening. Yeah. Uh, so, like I said, we're only a few episodes in, and uh, my wife is leaving on a trip this weekend. She's going to Detroit, actually, uh, for her for her art stuff. So, I probably won't get to get back into this for a little bit, but I'm quite excited to watch it again uh, and and see where it all finishes up. So, yeah, if you, I know it's it's weird to say watch this show about the exploration of serial killers that isn't really about. A serial killer necessarily 
but about the people who are figuring out what they were and why they think and do what they do. But it's, it's, it's excellent. No, cool. Yeah. As you were talking, I was waiting for you to say something about that. And I'm like, wait, what, when is this, is this uh, like a serial thing or is this a, you know, like, like a, um, not make believe, it's, but you know, scripted. No, it's a, it's a drama on, on Netflix that yeah. is based off of real people, but, certainly feels like it's it's deep enough as as storytelling goes to be embellished i'm sure in some ways yeah. but is also eerily accurate beat brought up the the movie zodiac in the in the chat and yes zodiac is another one where you watch that movie and it is quite accurate in everything that it portrays, but it's still also such a compelling film in the way that they told the story. And it doesn't give you answers because it can't give you answers, uh, but it gives you enough information that you kind of feel like you've gotten answers by the end of it. And this, I feel that that's what this is going to do to a certain degree as well. So that is Mindhunter and that is on Netflix and you can find the two comic books that I have, uh, well, three technically with the two issues. Uh, Nightwing New World Order and Batman White Knight at your local comic book shop or if you don't have a local comic book shop uh, go to comicsology.com um, that is it for the else views we will be right back do you like scary movies did you answer yes to that question have you ever thought hmm I'd really like to listen to two random strangers talk on the internet about some movies that I may or may not have watched at some point in my life sometimes they even bring guests on which adds to a little bit of the banter. Sometimes we cover the news of the week. Sometimes we don't talk about the movie at all. Sometimes one of us gets a little bit drunk. It's just the way that we do things over at the Podcast of Terror, which is a production of Galactic Netcast, in case you weren't sure. If you're interested in this, please go ahead and head over to gncast.com slash pot. Subscribe and enjoy the crap out of it. And we're back and it is time for the else words. This is our big topic, um, basically a story that I've, picked out that i figured hey we might get a little bit more out of this you know talking about this separately and that is netflix plans to release 80 that's eight zero original films in 2018 that is more than a movie a week and all of them are adam sandler films <laughs> um actually the first one that they mentioned is the uh the will smith uh starred i think is what they had they have star uh, bright uh, no they, which... they mean star he it, he's, he's starring in the film so yeah. he's the star uh bright yeah which looks really good it looks like something that should be coming out in the theaters it certainly seems up there when when you go back to when he was the the last human alive in the world full of vampires i am legend. Uh, i am legend yeah it, it 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 certainly seems to be of the same quality of that although looks even more interesting because it's a mix of fantasy world in real world cops. So it's kind of like, uh, what was the alien Legion was the, the TV series that had, it started out as a movie with James Caan and Mandy Patinkin and then became alien nation. Thank you. B. If you ever have the chance, Greg, or go watch the movie alien nation. And then yeah. if you want to, you can try to follow it up to the TV series, which was also really good. Uh, and unfortunately, way too short lived. But it's kind of like it seems like it's that, except with fantasy stuff as opposed to like elves and orcs and things, as opposed to aliens. Um, but so the cool thing is, and there's not really there's they talked about that. They talked about they released eight original films in Q3. Um, those included Death Note, uh, Ange the popular based on the popular Japanese manga series, um, Angelina Jolie's First They Killed My Father drama about the Cambodian genocide. Um, Naked, a romantic comedy featuring Marlon Wayans, and and the anorexic anorexia drama To the Bone, starring Lily Collins. The the interesting thing with this is uh, they plan on ranging anywhere from mil the million dollar Sundance hit, all the way up to something on a much larger scale, like the Will Smith starred Bright. I believe that's why I believe it starred is because they were comparing it to the you know the bigger budget movies. The other part, the other side of this article is that a lot of the movie chains feel like this is still Netflix trying to eat their lunch. 
because with how they do their deals, they still release will release the movies movies in theaters. Um, you know, at the very least in more art house theaters to where the movies then qualify for Oscars and, you know, all these different awards and then release them the same day and date as, you know, on Netflix as they do in the theaters. Right. Which is, which is a silly rule to still have in place. Uh, we're we're going to have to see the breakdown of that rule at some point. The, the movies only count if they've shown up in the theaters. The Oscars have a lot of growing to do this year anyways, but that's going to be something that I think will will fall off eventually. When we're we're seeing the Emmys have realized that the streaming services are are bringing highest quality content, just like HBO has done for the past several years before that, they know that it's not just being on broadcast TV that makes you a TV show. At some point, the Oscars will have to do the same thing and realize that just because you're not in a theater that people pay to go to, uh, you can still qualify for for awards uh because you are making yeah. quality content it, it's a weird loophole to have to step into yeah like honestly i look at this and i'm thinking okay this is great you know they've got obviously they have the money um you know also because they they raised the prices on netflix you know for me it's two dollars um for the 4k you know four stream 4k content but at the same time i look at this and i'm going you know what there's a lot of the stuff that I watch on there that I love. You know, there's a lot of stand-up specials that I watch. You know, those aren't that expensive to make. You know, the there's some of the TV shows that they're either co-producing with a another, um, you know, like over in the UK or you know, in you know, some other market, or that they're, they're partnering here to have the exclusive rights to where that's it's then broadcast as Netflix originals around the world. I'm looking at Riverdale and. You know, Better Call Saul and Pretty Little Liars was that like that too. It's one of these things. I look at this and I go, "This is, I'm perfectly okay with this," because Netflix is going to have a gap to fill. I mean, like like you said, you know, with uh, Marvel pulling, you know, earlier with Disney pulling their stuff out of Netflix, that's going to leave a lot of movies that people aren't going to be able to watch, and. You know, for some of these movies, you can go, well, you can watch this, but Netflix has just as much, if not, you know, just as good qual- uh, movies over here that would fill that same niche. Do you want to do this other service or do you want to do what you've been doing for a while? Yeah. And the other part of it is that it's not just enough to have some great content, but when you have 80 movies planning to come out in a year, now not all those movies are going to appeal to every single person. But with that number, it's likely that there's going to be at least one movie a month that you're going to be like, oh, I really wanted to see this. And it keeps you subscribed to Netflix. Whereas, you know, you you might be an HBO watcher specifically for Game of Thrones and one other thing. And then the rest of the year, you're like, I don't really give a shit about HBO's content or I can catch up on it when I go to watch Game of Thrones again. So I pay for my my two months of Game of Thrones to get all those episodes as they're airing. And then I watch everything else on the on the channel at the same time. And then I back off again. Netflix having this amount of stuff, it's like, oh, I was going to stop after I finished watching, like right now watching Mindhunter, but then they're bringing me Stranger Things right after that. And, oh, well, crap, as soon as I finish Stranger Things, this Bright movie's coming out. And so they just know now there's something that's going to continue. Like Punisher is coming up. Yeah, exactly. Beat. There's there's so much stuff that you can't live without it. You feel like mm-hmm. even for the the two dollar a month price hike, it's still the level that you're getting is worth it. You you look at the the movie pass thing that they were doing that is ten dollars a month to watch all the the new movies that you want, except with the caveats of one a day and no IMAX and and all these are the things that are a part of it. Well, ten dollars a month for still a movie a day is pretty damn good uh, if I utilize it all the time. And that's the same thing with Netflix. If I'm utilizing it, it's a great deal. If I'm not utilizing it, if I'm not getting content out of it, and that's what happened with Netflix for me with the DVDs, is I would sit there and have a DVD on my fucking mail thing for three months and I paid more than twice what the cost of the DVD would have been to buy it and never watched it and and yeah. hopefully send it back at some point or 
lose it and then have to pay for the DVD anyways. <laughs> so it's it's the, what is my first go-to when I turn on the TV? It, at this point in time, because of cable, I turn on the TV and my first thing is I still look at my, I look at what's live real fast. And then I look at my DVR to see what we have stocked up. But after that, my next thing is probably going to be to go to Netflix. Mm -hmm. And and you want to be in that position. You want to be everything that I'm interested in right now, or at least the the biggest amount of things I'm interested in are in this place. You know, whereas there might be a show that I'm interested in on Hulu, or there might be a show that I'm interested in on Amazon Prime, or there's only one fucking show that anybody gives a crap about on CBS streaming uh, at the moment. And even that's kind of playing with who gives a crap about it. Right, B? But yes, at, at this point in time, those are the the also rants to it. And that's what Amazon had said recently. We did the story about them, too, is that they're looking for their Game of Thrones, which is great. If you can get your Game of Thrones, excellent. But you need a lot of content. You have to have a lot of things for people's eyes to get drawn to because it's once you're here, how do we keep you here? That was the Facebook thought process. It's like, hey, you're in Facebook. We never want you to leave. We want to Hotel California your fucking ass and, and just <laughs> keep you pinned down. First of all, Facebook, consent matters. And second of all, just like, I don't know that the content on Facebook is ever going to be that compelling it, it's only compelling because it's your friends and your family and you feel maybe obligated sometimes netflix brings you compelling content and and some of it may not be the greatest stuff in the world but it's still the stuff that's like oh well maybe i'll see what this one day at a time remake series is like and oh it's actually pretty good mm -hmm. and oh i'll give a couple episodes of this ashton kutcher thing a try oh it's not for me but it kept you there you know, that hour that it kept you there and kept you engaged, it's like, it's not that the quality wasn't good, it's just that it wasn't your kind of show. Or or maybe the quality is really bad, like that Richie Rich show, but you're just like, but I know, what were the odds that I was really going to get something I wanted out of a Richie Rich show? Yeah. Uh, so you move on, but there's here's 40 other things of the stuff that you like, and that's where all that thumbs up and thumbs down made a lot of sense for a good long time. And the recommendation thing, and Comcast does that too but i i don't think they've they've landed that algorithm nearly as well and they they don't have the same supply of stuff to you because it still relies on content providers and and wanting pay for it and stuff and netflix is like if you're here all of this is yours you know come with me into a world of pure imagination and uh <laughs> you eventually get sucked into the pipe also, I should point out, uh, full disclosure, I do work for Target, who has the exclusive deal for Stranger Things merchandising. <laughs> um, that is a Netflix pro uh, program. <laughs> Sorry, I just looked at the end and it said, um, at the end of the interview, Hastings and Sarandos pull, uh, pulled on Stranger Things themed light uh, Christmas light sweaters, tub thumping for a season two premiere on October 27th, as well as promoting the company's merchandise deal with Target for the show. Which I gotta say, there's a lot, like quite a bit of the stuff that I do like with their their whole all their merchandising stuff. I like the fact that se the season one Blu-ray is in a VHS. Uh, like it, it looks, looks like, like a classic VHS case, yes. yeah. And like uh, like complete with the like the uh, it's like a box inside of a box because you you actually pull up and then it's the VHS tape you open up to ha that has the discs in there. I'm like that's pretty sweet. Um, but yeah, it's it's basically what I've been doing is answering phone calls like, you no, know, we didn't get any more of the Stranger Things fun go pops. Word of word of thing, you gotta buy all of them. You can't just buy the Chase variants. Come on. <laughs> I wanted to say that so many times to people, but it's just like, don't be a dick. <laughs> you know, it's just like just tell them come in here, buy all the eleven dolls, you know, the fun co pops and all that stuff. Anyways, I digress. No, I'm honestly excited for this because honestly, I, I didn't Netflix also it, with the whole thumb up, th thumbs up, thumb down thing. I'd seen for gosh, you know, for a majority of Q3 advertising like, oh, you'd like, you know, naked, which it's they're they're probably right because you know I do like Marlon Wayans and I like you know his comedies. I liked his show Marlon. I don't know if it got renewed or canceled. Um, probably got canceled, but 
and but I had not heard of you know the Angelina Jolie uh, drama or the Lily Collins drama. Like I had heard of Death Note, you know, and, and seen things about it, but I've also heard you know bad things about Death Note. So I'm like, I'll skip it. But I I feel like <laughs> a lot of the stuff we heard about. The, the bad stuff about Death Note had to do with the fact of the choices that they made in casting and stuff and yeah. and basically Americanizing a what was originally a Asian property yeah. and then yeah I, there there's certainly things to be said for for that argument but it's it's I don't quite consider it the same thing as having a a property based off of a book or something that has primarily Caucasian characters anyways, and then you're one person of color, they also make Caucasian. That to me is worse <laughs> than, <laughs> than than what you're saying. Or when you have a Caucasian actor or actress playing a person of color in your movie, unless it's Robert Tuddy Jr. <laughs> because that was <laughs> that was just hilarious. Uh I get why people had a problem with it, but it was still yeah. really funny. The other thing is what I I didn't even realize is that Netflix's first original movie was the Crouching Tiger Hidden Dragon sort of destiny the the mm-hmm. the Ang Lee uh, sequel movie um that was also produced by the Weinstein Company yeah but that was just February of last year yeah their first original film was February of last was a was a sequel but was just a year ago. Or now, almost two years. Wait, wait. Wasn't Beast of No Nations? Wasn't that a movie? I don't know, but according to the article here, their first original film came from the Weinstein Company. Uh, so it hashtag Me Too, and it, it was a sequel. To, yeah, it was this one. So yeah. they're saying that it was released in February of 2016. Or maybe it's maybe Beast of No Nations is. It's 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 like Lily Hammer, where a lot of people don't think of it as being the first because it's like a co-production or something. I don't know. Um, all I know is I had because I've I've had for a while uh, Beast of No Nations in my my list thing for a while, but I don't I don't know. I mean, it's honestly we're gonna get more more original movies, which probably means more original ideas from either from creators that you know we wouldn't get ideas from them. Can, can I tell you what I really hope this is? What I really hope we get from this? Um, and it's, you know, to get back on the Thor Ragnarok uh, Taika Waititi thing. If we could get the the movie that he has been, he's been, you know, talking about uh, working on, uh, the werewolves, uh, you know, the the answer to what we do in the show from the werewolf side. Yeah, the sequel. Um, the sequel. If we could get that on here as one of these. Now, probably, it probably wouldn't be 2018, but, you know, on Netflix, or even the they talked about doing the through the police department that that is in New Zealand while this is all going on as a TV series. I would love that. Or the Shaun of the Dead sequel that got debunked the next day. Oh, I'm yeah. sure it did. It, it 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 doesn't make any sense. It it couldn't be a sequel at all. We went from a world of zombies to a world of vampires, but. From Dustal Sean sounds very funny, and it's oh, yeah. a great thing to play off of. Yeah, it's it's one of those like, you know, like where we get, you know, basically if we can get with this, where we're either getting, actually, this is one of the things I would love to see. Netflix take the what is it, the Hollywood blacklist, um, you know, the movies that like the scripts that you know were the the best movies that never got made that didn't get made that year, and they start making them. I don't want to see anything that specific. I just want to see them continue well, to be brave in what they do and, and allow filmmakers to be brave in the way that they've let showrunners yeah. be brave and saying, we we know that you make great content. We trust in your, in your ability to do that and your mindset. And we just want to invest in you to continue to make great art. And, and in, in return, you let us have it. That that's, that is the dream of I get paid to make the stuff that I love and I get an outlet to then show that stuff to other people. That That's great. It's sort of an erasure of barriers that Hollywood seemingly has. To, to, I'm completely an outsider. I don't have a lot of, of industry background or anything to, to be able to back that up. But yeah, the it's another 
film studio, but it's doing things very differently. Mm -hmm. And that's great. And it it probably doesn't involve massages in hotel rooms. So that's good. Uh, God, I hope it doesn't. I really hope it doesn't. I'm as excited as I am about any potential movies because there there could be great movies and there could be shit movies. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I reference the Adam Sandler thing is none of the stuff that, that he's doing is interesting to me, but I appreciate the fact that Netflix is letting him do it because it's interesting to somebody. And if all they were doing was that kind of stuff, I would not be a Netflix subscriber. But there's doing stuff that is interesting to me as well. It, it, more content is always better as long as it's various and reaches to as many different types of audiences as possible. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess like I got nothing else to add to this. I mean, just because I'm excited, you know, to see what we what we get. Basically, what I'm what I'm thinking is it would have to have 40 films either wrapped or wrapping filming right now, you know, and then the other 40 starting like in, you know, in pre-production to have this all because they said 80 films in neck with from in the calendar year of 2018. That's a lot. Oh, they so, could just go ass heavy. <laughs> it's just yeah. like everything on December twenty fourth. Merry <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> but no, I mean, I, I turn this to you guys. What, what would you like to see Netflix do? You, know, you can tell us about any of your opinions on anything else you want uh, that we talked about here, and you can do that by with a couple options. You can leave us a voicemail at eight zero five three two eight three nine six six, or you can email us mail at elsnerds dot com. Um, and all of our subscription options and links can be found over at gncasts.com slash subscribe. And you can join us on our Facebook page under Galactic Netcasts. Um, that's also where you can find, you know, if you search Galactic Netcasts all over, you will find, you know, our Twitter, our Tumblr, all that good stuff. Um, you can join the show. You can follow the show on Twitter at Elsnerds. You can follow our producers. Evan is at Mr. Underscore Fusion. Beatmaster is at Beatmaster80. Uh, you can follow Sean, our uh, guy who is awesome and helps us out at S Burns PA. We can call him a co-host. He's, he's definitely co-host. our co-host status. Oh yeah, yeah, co-host, a uh, friend, lover, um, something like that. Yeah, at S Burns PA, and you can find me at that Gregor and Corey. Where can people find the comics that you and Levi do? Oh, man, I have been slacking up a storm, unfortunately, but you can still get all of the existing content of Don't Ask Comics at don'tascomics.com, and uh, hopefully I will get back on board of posting some of the classic comics like Spells and Levi's World, and Levi was doing Inktober, but I think he might have hit his uh, slack pocket, too, but you still can see some of the great stuff from his blog. Uh, it's all, if you go to the the site, donutscomics.com, it gives you the opportunity to go to all the different various sites for Balyar, Levi's World, Shock that he does with our friend Scott Hall, and so on. So yeah, there, there's tons of stuff already there. There will be more stuff added shortly. The final thing to be said is this has been a Don't Tell Glenn production. We will see you next week. Or else I'll make another excuse. <laughs>
For more on this Galactic Network podcast, go to GNCast.com. That's G-N-C-A-S-T-S dot com. <laughs>